Thanks, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday, January 16th meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. The first item on the agenda is minutes, and we have the minutes in our packet of Wednesday, December 5th to review. I'd entertain a motion on those minutes. Move we approve the minutes. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? And those are approved unanimously. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is public comment period. This is a new item on the planning board agenda, and this is for the purpose of any public comment not related to another item on the agenda. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, we're going to move on actually further down our agenda. This is going to be item 6A under new business, and this is the public shade tree committee discussion about the potential role of new trees at the proposed office building pro project at 236 North Pleasant Street and 12 Halleck Street. Is there someone from the public shade tree committee that would like to speak to this? Hi, I'm Henry Lappin, the chair of the Public Shade Tree Committee, and thank you for taking the time. Uh, mostly, I just want to check in with you. We have I've met with you before, and uh, about this project, and you know, just in general, to think about trees when new projects are planned, and even before the step. I'm told that at this point the design is finalized, so there's not much I can say, I guess, in terms of this one. But it's just the idea of thinking about street trees before, before before this point, but at any point, soon, as soon as possible. So um, if you look at the map, the North Pleasant Street is pretty well shaded because there's that bump out of, of land with trees there, and that's great. Along Halleck Street itself, though, in front of the building, there's not going to be much. There is the narrow tree belt. I know Alan Snow, the tree warden, is reluctant to plant in such a narrow belt because the trees generally don't survive. So. I mean, nothing can be done in this terms, I guess. I mean, you can tell me more about that, but um, we're hoping that with as new developments get proposed, thoughts including expanding the size of the tree belt and things like that happen so that we can keep trees. It would be lovely to have a few shade trees there, shading the building, protecting it visually from the road, et cetera. So that's mostly what I want to say. Great, thanks so much for joining us and for your information and for those present and those watching at home. Yes, the decision was already approved uh, for this particular project. We appreciate your input. Um, if the Shade Tree Committee or individuals would like to um, promote a uh, change to the design, I'd recommend contacting the developers directly. And certainly I'd recommend to the Shade Tree Committee and others that want to impact the design of projects in general that they can always attend the meetings uh, prior to decisions being issued. Um, so we would certainly welcome your input during that process going forward. Right. Often we hear about it after the design is pretty far along. So um, if there's a way we could find out sooner and like, oh, this new project's coming up, would you please give input here? That would be something that'd be great. I'd be happy to talk with the developers that if I talk to Christine, can I get their contact info? Yes, I'd be happy to give Mr. Lappin the contact info for the developers of this project. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And uh, does anyone else have anything else to say to me? Or Well, thank you very much for the time, then. Thank you very much for your time and comments. Yep. We're shortly going to move on to our 705 item, which is a ZBA application public hearing. So this is EBA 2009-19, Dave Wasenda, 191 West Pomeroy Lane, Hickory Ridge Golf Club. This is a special permit to construct and operate a five megawatt ground-mounted photovoltaic solar energy facility, including access roads, overhead utility lines, and other appurtenant facilities required for the project. The presentation is by the applicant for the review and recommendations to the ZBA by the planning board. Would the applicant like to make a presentation? <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Doug Tellitman. I'm a business development director for New England for Centrica Business Solutions, formerly known as Direct Energy Solar, we're the contractor on this proposed project. 
Uh, with me presenting today to my right is Charles Kovacic, uh, project manager with Centrica Business Solutions, and to my left is Jason Gold, uh, engineer of record with the ESS Group. Um, we're here today to talk about a proposed project uh, to be located at the uh, Hickory Ridge Golf Club location, um, 191 West Pomeroy Lane. Uh, the pro proposed project is a 5.24 uh, megawatt solar photovoltaic facility. Um, it's projected to generate approximately 6.7 million kilowatt hours of emission-free energy per year. Uh, just to give that a little bit of reference, that's enough to power approximately 1,000 homes uh, in the vicinity. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're very happy to uh, answer any questions that the board has uh, regarding this project. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jason, who's going to give you a background um, on the project, and then I guess we'll uh, open it up for questions. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good evening. So the property is a 150-acre parcel. It's plat 19B, lot 10. It's actually, because it's such a large project, it's actually in four different zoning districts. Uh, they are the primary flood prone conservancy, FPC, is the majority of it. Uh, the northern portion is within, partially within the neighborhood residence, uh, the RN zone. There's an outlying residence zone to the south, RO, and uh, also village residence, RVN, RVC, to the east. Uh, that, that's the entire property. The project itself is entirely within the FPC and the RN zones. There are several resource areas uh, within the site. The Fort River divides the site. Uh, the Fort River is the, the main river. I can figure out how to work this thing. There we go. Um, Plum Brook is down in the southeast, which feeds into it. They're bordering vegetated wetlands throughout the site. These all include uh, associated buffers and 30-foot no-work zone. The majority of the property is also within the 100-year FEMA flood zone associated with the Fort River. And a significant portion of the property is within the priority habitats of rare species and estimated habitats of rare wildlife area. And that is currently under review by the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, the NHESP. The site's not located within uh, any national or local historic districts. The surrounding area is mostly residential. There's some agricultural to the west and to the northwest. As uh, Doug already mentioned, the property is currently used as a golf course. The proposed project is a 5.24 megawatt uh, DC project, split into two different arrays, one on the eastern side and one on the western side. In total, there's approximately 15,026 modules, 115 inverters, 17 utility poles, and an equipment pad. Each array will be surrounded by a seven foot high chain link fence for security. And as requested by the CONCOM, uh, the bottom of the fence will be raised eight inches above the ground, and that allows wildlife to pass beneath it. The western fenced area is 11.7 acres, and the eastern area covers approximately eight and a half acres. And that's 20.2 acres in total. The arrays are about 180 to 400 feet away from residences to the north along Boulders Drive and over 1,000 feet away from the residences to the south along West Pomeroy Lane. The site will be accessed by two gravel, proposed gravel roads. Uh, they're both gonna cross the Fort River at existing crossings. There are some uh, existing bridges there now that are being evaluated, and those locations will be used. The road to the west uh, will require a curb cut off West Pomeroy Lane, and the eastern road will be off of an existing, the existing parking lot and use the existing driveway. Uh, as requested by the fire department, uh, we propose gates, locked gates on the south side of both bridges and that's to keep the public off of those, off those bridges and on the south side of the river. Uh, one of the nice things about this project, since it's on a golf course, it's already cleared, so there's not really a lot of uh, tree removal. There's not really a lot of grading. A couple of spots where the slopes are too steep for the 
racking will be graded just to reduce that slope a bit. Um, but there's not much of it. There are no large trees uh, greater than six inches in diameter within the public right of way that will have to be removed. And within the, within the golf course itself, there's only uh, about 198 large trees to be removed. So it's really not a lot of site work on this project. Uh, because there's not a lot of site work required, there's no significant change in ground cover, which means there's no increase in stormwater. Um, so there's no stormwater controls required or proposed. The plans do include soil erosion sediment control. Uh, that will be filter socks along the um, down gradient perimeter of it, as well as your typical construction entrance and stockpiles. Again, there's not a lot of grading, not a lot of earthwork. Um, so sediment, sediment control is, is uh, not that much to it. All the zoning setbacks and land coverage requirements have been met. The property line setbacks are a little odd because we're in so many different zones. So the rear setbacks are either 20 feet or 15 feet, um, 20 feet within the FPC zone and 15 feet within RN. There's two different front setbacks for the three different zoning districts. FPC has a 40-foot front setback. RO and RBC both have a 25-foot front setback. And then there's a 20 foot and a 10 foot side setback for the FPC and the RVC zoning districts respectively. All the proposed building and lot coverages are within that allowed by the zoning ordinance. And that is also broken up by zoning district. So within RN, proposed building coverage is 3.6 acres proposed. That's less than the 4.3 allowed. Within FPC, 2.9 acres is proposed. 12.3 is allowed. Within the RO district, 0 0.2 acres is proposed, and that's less than the 1.2 acres allowed. As far as lot coverage, within the RN zone, 3.9 acres is proposed, and that's less than the 6.4 allowed. Within FPC, it's 5.7 acres proposed, less than 18.4 acres. And within the RO district, uh, only 1.2 acres is proposed, which is less than the 2.0 allowed, and that is, is a table on the plan set, if you need to see those numbers. The project does require a special permit under use 3.340, which is other energy uh, facility use. So the project's been designed to meet all nine conditions of the zoning bylaw special permit findings required. And if you want, I can go through those. Each of those nine? I think that's probably not necessary. Okay. Again, the planning board is acting in an advisory capacity to the ZBA, which will be making the actual decision on the permit. So if you'd like to proceed. Okay. That'll save you lots of time. Mm -hmm. I think that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so generally, you know, it's a passive use. It's solar. There's going to be a lot less. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's very minimal traffic a few times a year. You know, somebody visiting the site for maintenance. Um, they're, you know, far away from the residences. The existing woods along the perimeter will remain. Uh, and the CONCOM is reviewing the project. Uh, we had one meeting with them. The second meeting is coming up on January 23rd. Uh, the zoning board meeting will be on February 7th. Uh, the MEPA review has been completed. Uh, they issued their certificate on December 21st. And as I mentioned earlier, the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, uh, that review is ongoing. We're in the middle of preparing a habitat management plan now. And that's the overview. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for that. Are there questions, comments from the board? Michael. Um, <clears throat> on uh, page two of your uh, 11, 14, 18 ZBA application. Uh, you state that no important scenic features have been identified at this site. Uh, who decides what is an important scenic feature? I'm sorry, can you point me to the paragraph? Um, it's um, page two on the, I don't know what paragraph it is, on, on the uh, ZBA application of 11, 14, 18. 
No other unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features have been identified? Is that what you're No important of? scenic features have been identified. Right. I right. think that's a paraphrase of the full statement, which is natural or it's an, it's an illusion of the, of the right. full statement, yes. But you, you state that no important scenic features have been identified at the site. And I'm, my question is, who decides what is an important scenic feature? Uh, we haven't identified anything that we believe is, an, is a significant scenic feature. Well, then that is a matter of opinion. Because I would, I would suggest that there are significant important scenic features on that site. Um, from, from that site, there are splendid views of the Holyoke Range from several parts of the property. And the river itself is an important scenic resource. Uh, people who are not associated with the golf course canoe and kayak up and down that river on a regular basis. And that is an important scenic resource for the town. Would you contest that? Um, we would not contest that the uh, Fort well, River. Then is why a did you say there resource. were no scenic resources? I think it may, um, and let me first preface this by I am in no way trying to be argumentative about this point, but I think what we said in our application and what you're saying might be two different things. Um, we completely agree that the Fort River is a beautiful scenic resource. We also assert that there is nothing in our plans that will in any way alter the Fort River. Um, so you know, I think what we're implying in our application is that there are no important or historic scenic features on the site that we plan to alter in any fashion. Now I agree with you that the view for people that are canoeing down the river will change as a result of the deployment of a solar facility on the property. Um, that's not what we were saying. We we're saying that we didn't identify any important scenic features that we need to remove in order to facilitate this project. Um, and we're, we're certainly happy to uh, speak with the board if you feel that there are important scenic features that you would like to make sure remain on the property, we would do everything in our power to make sure that those features remain. I think part of my uh, concern is that the scenic features uh, have to do with the view shed, which is observable from the property, not the property itself but that in individuals who make use of the property in its current configuration have access to an incredible view shed of the Holyoke Range and surrounding area. Uh, and that will be uh, eliminated completely by the presence of the solar farm. So first of all, I apologize that I'm not familiar with um, the geography. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, but um, as part of uh, the plans for this project, uh, there have been uh, significant talks that are continuing and ongoing regarding the conveyance of the portion of the property that is not going to be used for solar to the town of Amherst. So um, a vast majority of the property or a significant portion of the property will remain available uh, to the public's use um, at the town's discretion as if this project comes to its fruition, uh, the town will end up owning a significant portion of this property. Uh, that answers part of my question. The other part of my, my, my concern is that the very area on which the solar fields are proposed to be located are the very places where the view shed is most significant. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the property, uh, I'm, uh, that's too bad. Oh, I am extremely I, I'm familiar with the property. Excuse I'm not me, familiar sir. With excuse me, I'm not familiar. Yes, my apologies. Um, if, if you were familiar with the property, you would know that the area, particularly the West Solar Array, is significantly uh, underneath and visible from the Holyoke Range viewshed, and that is the area where the significant 
uh, uh, questions uh, apply. Um, it's and I, that that's not arguable. What is what, I, what I'd like to know is what the plans are for the rest of the property that you suggest are being conveyed to the town. Um, that would be up to the town. Um, we don't have any plans for that remaining portion of the property. Um, the talks that have been ongoing and continue um, are intended uh, to result in the town owning and having 100% control over the portion of the property that they own and the town is free to do with it what they like. So if I could interject here, Michael, uh, first I want to clarify again, we're acting in an advisory capacity, making a recommendation to the ZBA. Also, to my understanding, we don't have information about a specific agreement between the applicant and the town uh, for purchase of a section of the property. So that's not within our scope tonight. And I know that Pari had a question as well. Right. And just, just to um, expound on what you said very slightly, there is no agreement at this point in time. Um, just discussions that have been very productive uh, according to the town. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, I just have a clarification question for you and then a question for Ms. Bestrup. So if I read the plans correctly, there's going to be a number of perhaps smaller trees that will be removed in order to install the panels, right? Yes. And my question for you is, when would the snow warden, uh, Mr. Snow, sorry, the tree warden make a decision or he's going to have to review this at some point, right? Chris? The tree warden will have to review any trees that um, are proposed to be taken down in the town right of way. But if trees are proposed to be taken down on the property itself, the tree warden would not necessarily be involved with that. Just one quick question. I think you quantified them. Can you just repeat how many trees you'll be removing? Within the property, we counted. Just make sure I get that number right. I can just add, I met with Alan Snow, the tree warden, last week. And we're only removing three trees on West Pomeroy. Two small, um, I forgot the name of the trees, and one tree that was actually chopped up by Eversource because it was in the power lines. Um, and Alan's snow is all right with that. And we, I'll fill out an application and we'll go through the due process and we'll, um, there'll be a fee for those three feet, those th three trees and they'll plant three trees somewhere else in the town. But he has no, he didn't have any jurisdiction over the trees in the, the actual property. Thank you. Within the property, that number is 198. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you were having the, I think it's, I don't know how many, maybe two bridges evaluated structurally. And is that to see if they would hold the loads that you think you'll need to use? Or is that thinking about having to beef up the bridges to carry the loads for construction or maintenance? So I think it's both. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've uh, discussed the um, load requirements uh, with the fire department uh, based upon uh, what types of vehicles they want to be able to get over the bridges. So we're going to make sure that the load capacity on the bridges is sufficient to um, hold the types of vehicles that the fire department has told us they want to be able to get over, um, which uh, they said do not include fire trucks, but just uh, ambulances and sm other smaller emergency vehicles. And um, we also want to uh, make sure that the bridges have the load capacity to handle the equipment that would traverse the bridges during construction. So there's uh, specific numbers that are gonna need to be met. And if those numbers cannot be met based upon the existing structural capacity of the bridges, they'll need to be reinforced. So we have an engineer, a structural engineer, who is uh, coming on site to uh, take the measurements necessary to make those calculations. Um, once those calculations are made, uh, we will know whether or not the bridges require uh, reinforcement uh, or if they are adequate under their existing structure. Just quick, so that is all done before it goes to the ZBA? We expect that it will be done before it goes to ZBA. The engineer is coming on site this Friday. Um, you know, 
within a week from that point, we expect that they'll have the calculations done. It's possible that they may be done in time for the CONCOM meeting a week from today, but certainly by fe February the 7th. Maria? Um, so, sorry, I noticed on the previous plan, the road to the eastern array used to cut through existing parking lot, and then now it's much better, I think. It's avoiding a lot of the wetter area. Um, but there was a note about the parking lot being laid down area. Does that mean like for construction, your staging area, and do you st so there, you no longer have that area? Are you going to be using any public space to you know, use as what you call lay down area? Is that staging from equipment or what is that exactly? So I'll, um, I'll let Chaz address the second part of your question or really the only part of your question, but just to comment on the uh, change in plans. Um, that was done at the uh, suggestion uh, of the Conservation Commission and uh, we were happy to accommodate that suggestion. That's why the, the road has moved. In terms of are we planning on using a uh, parking area for staging? Potentially, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna have to store some equipment on that parking lot before we bring it over the bridge. Um, I believe we have full use of that parking lot until it is conveyed to the town. So, um, yeah, we will be using that. So the new portion of the road will be built simultaneous to the PV install, and you can still access that road that was previously the access road, correct? So you won't need to come into the right-of-way. In other words, you won't be needing any space beyond the property as far as uh, staging. Correct. Okay. Um, and I guess, sorry, the second part is, um, so this is all still gravel road, and I guess CONCOM will address, you know, the issue of, like, runoff into the river with the gravel and whatnot. Is there, are you planning on plowing that at all, or...? Uh, you know, for winter, no. Okay. Michael? Uh, clarify what you just said about the relationship of the west, of the, sorry, the east access road and the existing parking lot. Um, I, I thought I heard you say that it was not necessary to go into the public way from the existing parking lot to the east access road. Is that correct? Um, you, Jason can address that. I, I didn't say that, um, but if I said something that sounded like that, I apologize. Um, Jason, you can a address the East Access Road. I'm not sure what the question was. So the East Access Road, there's an, this, road, this section of the road right along here is existing. There's already a road and it goes to a, a parking lot uh, right about here. So that, that section of the road will be utilized and then the <laughs> And then the rest of the road from here up is proposed. Yeah. And the, the parking lot I believe Jason is referring to is at the maintenance shed? Um, yes, but that was not the parking lot that was originally proposed as a staging area. Right. There the was parking a, lot originally proposed as a staging area is the current parking lot for customers. Yes. A previous submittal showed a potential laydown area in this parking lot here. Yeah. That was a previous submittal when the road was coming off from that section. That's, that's normally something that's shown on the uh, construction plans. But it just looked like a good um, a good area since the road was come off was coming off that area, so it was shown in those previous plans. Now that the road's been moved, um, the actual laydown area will will be determined during the construction plans. Well, if the actual current if the if the if the laydown area or what, whatever you want to call it, the place where you store materials, mm -hmm. uh, is now in the vicinity of the existing maintenance shed, then to get from there to the west array will re also require going on to the public way, will it not? It depends on the, how, they, um, how they construct it. I don't know if they're going to, and again, this is construction level detail, so whether or not they have one lay down area on each side um, or just one lay down area on the east and use uh, the existing roads to get over to the west, that's, that's a construction level detail that isn't, hasn't been finalized at this point. Chris. I just wanted to say that normally, um, well, often recently, 
the building commissioner has recommended that the planning board and the zoning board of appeals um, require a construction logistics plan from an applicant, and that can be, um, you know, uh, shown to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, depending on who's giving the permit. But it can also be something that's submitted later, and then it's reviewed by the building commissioner and the town engineer and the superintendent of public works um, to make sure that it all makes sense. So. The ZBA, one of your recommendations could be that um, the applicant uh, needs to submit a construction logistics plan and then the ZBA can figure out at what point does that get submitted and who reviews it. Thank you. David? How tall are the solar mod modules? So it, it, it is the question, um, just for clarification, related to the dimensions of the modules or when installed, how tall will the array be? The latter. Um, slightly less than eight feet at the highest point. Do you have a sense of how visibility of the, the modules um, in relationship to the seven foot tall chain link fence? Will they, will they be visible over the fence? I guess it depends upon the angle upon which they're being viewed from, but I would say that the uh, the highest point of the array will be higher than the fence. Um, and the fence is going to be transparent anyway, so. Jack? And if, um, Mr. Levenstein, I would also say that uh, the, the height difference between the top of the array and the top of the fence will be rel so relatively small that if you're a decent distance back, say on the south side of the Fort River, you probably would not be able to notice the height difference. Thank you. Jack? Uh, <clears throat> during the introduction, you mentioned the electricity would be used in the vicinity. Um, what sort of um, agreements do you foresee in terms of who will be the ultimate uh, user? So there would be, there are no agreements that are necessary. The, um, the, every bit of electricity that's produced by the system will just go on to the power grid and then will flow with all the other electricity that's on the power grid to um, wherever there's a draw. So the way I came up with a number of 1,000 homes is if an average home consumes 6,700 kilowatt hours of electricity per year, and the system generates 6.7 million kilowatt hours, that's 1,000 homes. Um, but the electricity flows like water. So wherever there's a draw, electricity will go there. The path of least resistance will be followed. And you know, eventually, every bit of the electricity that's being generated by this facility will be consumed somewhere, and it's going to be consumed first by those um, uh, homes and businesses that are closest by. But it, um, Eversource is going to be purchasing the power, and so they own it. And then they're just going to sell it to the homeowners, um, just like they sell any other power. It will not be differentiated in any way on the customer's electric bills. Customers not going to be not going to necessarily know or be notified um, what the source of their power is. Just like right now, customers aren't notified what the source of their power is. Um, so, uh, you know, you have every source is going to purchase a lot of times these large arrays. Every, you know, the the. Uh, the Eversource or National Grids uh, don't necessarily have to take on the electricity or they, they don't, you have to find some other off taker. So I'm just wondering, so you have an agreement with Eversource that they will uh, be purchasing the electricity? Yeah, under the uh, state's uh, smart tariff program, which is the new uh, performance uh, incentive program for solar uh, in Massachusetts, the utility is required to purchase 100% of the energy that's produced. And there's always a place for it to go. Um, there's always a place for it to go. And then you, you have a, uh, 
interconnection. I forget the terminology, but yes, there's, we do have there's a, a pr long process associated with that. Yeah, that process has been completed, and we do have uh, a signed interconnection services agreement in place. Other questions, comments, Michael? Yeah, I have a question about, sorry, I have a question about the physical interconnection. Uh, how does that happen? I understand that the two solar arrays are connected by uh, 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 Wire. wires. <laughs> Where does, the, how does the power get from the solar array complex to the grid? Um, by other wires on poles that are gonna uh, be going from West Pomeroy Lane location to uh, the array location. Can you show those on the map? The it's a strange thing. Um, it's right around here is the point of interconnection is an existing pole. So is there a, uh, a is it shown on the plans? I've not seen it about a, a series of, of poles or wires that run from uh, the array to Pomeroy Lane. It's along the west access yeah. road. I'll zoom in on it. But where do they, how do they get from there to there? Through that route? So these are proposed poles coming down along the side of the proposed gravel road. Oh, it's by the, right by the side of the access yeah. road. Okay, thank proposed you. Proposed poles along West Pomeroy, and then this is, oh, there we go. And then this is the um, existing pole. That's the point of interconnection. Okay, thank you. Jack. Uh, what is the status with the Conservation Commission, and what are the outstanding issues that you're resolving other than the bridge? So um, our, our status is we've had one meeting with them, and um, our next meeting is a week from today, and uh, they gave us uh, a checklist of items to address for the second meeting, many involving uh, uh, calculations uh, and things of that nature, but do you, do you have a list? Yeah, I don't have the entire list with me. Most, almost all of those comments are already included in this plan set that you have. Um, a couple of things that aren't on here uh, is flood storage. Uh, we're doing some flood calculations to determine whether or not uh, there's a loss of storage within the 100-year floodplain. Um, looks like there'll be uh, just a little bit, and so we'll, we'll grade in some compensatory uh, flood storage just to balance that out in the area. But everything else, um, relocating the road is one of them. Uh, we shifted the array around a little bit. Uh, it was a lot of minor stuff, but it's all included in this plan set. So I, um, just uh, referring back to my notes from the Conservation Commission meeting. So uh, some of the items of uh, homework, as the committee chair uh, termed it for us, um, were to uh, stake out the uh, areas of work uh, on the site, um, to provide detail on the type of seed mix that we would use, uh, for the uh, slow-growing uh, grass seed that would be planted uh, in the areas of the array um, to provide them with a uh, ongoing operation and maintenance plan, primarily considering um, not so much the operation and maintenance of the solar facility, but the operations, operation and maintenance of the site. Um, the studies, uh, the structural reviews of the bridges, uh, they wanted some detailed math uh, regarding the, uh, I think it's uh, termed BLSF areas. Um, they, um, <clears throat> one of the Conservation Commission members uh, noted that uh, potential perching areas for birds of prey, you know, may be removed from the site uh, as a result of the construction and that he wanted us to consider where such birds could possibly perch um, post-construction. Um, our answer to that at the time was the, there's going to be a bunch of poles they could probably do the same on. Um, um, they, uh, there is a sewer easement um, on the property uh, where there's an existing sewer line. They wanted us, I believe, to mark that um, either more clearly on the plans or actually flag it on site. Um, and it's now on the new plan set. Um, and uh, 
Uh, although this wasn't something they wanted us to address, they also talked about um, the town possibly employing a, a third party monitor to make sure that uh, everything that we said we were going to do during the construction phase was being done. And um, uh, that's pretty much all of the outstanding uh, issues that we intend to address next week. Thank you. Chris. I believe there was also an issue related to the natural heritage, um, the animals that are on the site, and um, the Conservation Commission has asked the uh, developer to um, address that issue and potentially provide some um, alternative areas that would uh, compensate for loss of habitat in the areas that they are developing. And perhaps the developers could speak to that issue. So we are developing a, um, uh, what's the term? Natural yeah, heritage? Habitat management plan. Yeah, habitat management plan. Um, you know, it's uh, actually our position that um, more natural habitat will be created as a result of this project than currently exists. Um, but still, you know, natural heritage uh, wants a habitat management plan, uh, which could potentially involve a um, conservation easement on the property, which we are currently developing. David? How long would you estimate the construction phase to be? I would estimate it at six months, but I'll defer to Chaz on that. Six months. Michael? Yes, I'd like to talk for a minute about the um, uh, decommissioning plan, which exists as part of the ZBA application on page 53 and, for, and following. Um, I think it's remarkably uh, appropriate that you include a decommissioning plan. Uh, we see so much these days about energy projects which don't work out the way they were expected to work out and need to be decommissioned, and the fact that you've included such a plan is, is admirable. Um, I'd like to question a few of the de details in that plan. Um, on, uh, in, in, uh, in step two, remo yeah, sorry, in step two removal, um, you state under the under number F vegetation that um, once all the components of the PSES are removed, the site will be returned to its present state with minimal work. Um, its present state is a golf course. Uh, you surely don't mean it will be returned to a golf course. Correct. Beca because uh, well, what do you mean by present state? Pardon me? It'll be returned to grass, regular. But that's not the present state. The present state is a mowed, carefully managed, carefully prepared turf grass facility. So I would say that um, our intention uh, was not to indicate that when the solar is one day potentially removed, that the property would revert back to a golf course property. Um, and if we gave that impression, I apologize. We, we, we don't mean to imply that it's going to go back to, you know, bent grass or Bermuda or whatever it is, um, but it will just go back to a natural uh, grass field. And number one, uh, under vegetation, that was number, that was number two, uh, PSES does not need any trees removed. Clearly that's incorrect because you're talking about the removal of approximately 200 mature trees at this point. This is within the decommissioning plan? Apparently, yes. So. You know, I, I would uh, suggest that maybe that means that we don't have to remove any trees in order to remove the system from the property. This is, so this is well after the system has been constructed. Uh, that's not what it says. It says the proposed PSES does not need any trees removed. Uh, then it's an error in our part. We'll remove it. It's an error in the vicinity of 200 trees. To clarify. I'm sorry? Yes, sir, it is. So it's an error in the area of 200, approximately 200 trees. Okay. So will the, recon re will the recommission, uh, sorry, will the uh, uh, decommissioning include the replacement of those trees? And if so, how are you going to replace 200, 100-year-old trees? Um, no, it will not. Then the decommissioning plan is seriously in error, I would, I would suggest. 
because it does not um, because it calls for the replanting of trees because yes it does not it, it says that you're going to return the area to its original state and it's not going to be replaced I would agree with that assessment okay Jack mm -hmm. um, so uh, with the Massachusetts the solar program isn't that old so there's a lot of solar arrays that have been built or in operation and, and so none of them have hit the 20 year lifespan. What do you envision uh, the, the potential of the solar being uh, replaced with another one? Or, I'm just curious uh, that the decommissioning would, is there a foregone conclusion that it goes away? Or what, what do solar companies uh, envision after the 20 year? Is it possible that, that you replace it? So, the question of decommissioning uh, comes up often, and the reason why we include it uh, as a routine matter of business is that um, a large number of solar arrays, especially those of this size and magnitude, are not owned by the property owner. They're owned by an investor or a third party, which comes in and leases the property, typically for a 20-year period. Um, and the towns uh, you know, across the state and other states have rightly expressed concern that what happens at the end of this 20-year period when the system owner or investor goes away. So uh, solar contractors started uh, including decommissioning plans. In this case, this is not the case. Um, uh, Applied Golf will be the owner and operator of this system. Um, so there, it is not a foregone conclusion that it will need to be decommissioned at the end of a 20-year period because there is no 20-year lease in place. There is no third-party owner. Um, so if the gist of your question is um, when is it reasonable to expect a decommission? It's very difficult to say. Um, the modules that are gonna be used in this project are warranted for 25 years and will likely pump out energy at a very significant clip for 30 or 40 years. Um, but at some point in the future, um, it may make economic sense to either replace the existing modules in the system with new modules, depending upon what the costs are 35 or 40 years from now and what incentives are available and therefore does it make economic sense to do so. And if it doesn't, it may make sense to remove the system from the property and do something else. So um, I just wanted to explain uh, why decommissioning plans are typically included, why those concerns do not apply to this particular situation, and you know, is a decommissioning inevitable? And I think the answer is no. Thank Ari? you. Um, so I understand that golf courses are artificial by nature. There's, they are altered landscapes to begin with. And um, I mean, I'm also partially concerned about the scenario in which after 20 or 25 years, um, if the panels would be removed, um, there is something that has really been altered in this landscape. And at that point, I would wonder if there's a way to somehow secure maybe not the replanting of 198 trees, but something that will restore this landscape to a certain degree. And that's why I asked the question about the tree warden recommendation and the Conservation Commission, because this is also a concern of mine that has been voiced, I think, by a couple of other people here. So to be determined. Chris. I think that's a recommendation that you could make to the ZBA that the um, planting of trees be included in the decommissioning plan. If 
I can um, just add, uh, in response to your concerns, I sense that um, the, um, the basis of your concerns are environmental in nature. So I do want to point out that uh, this property um, with solar on it is going to be significantly more friendly to the environment than as a golf course. Right? There will be no chemicals, no pesticides, no herbicides used in the management of this facility like are presently used on the golf course. And because the areas in the 200-foot buffer zone uh, between the river and the array are not going to be manicured like they are currently, those habitats are going to be much more natural to uh, the local wildlife than they currently are, um, which could encourage additional breeding or whatever else uh, might be a concern in the area. And as I mentioned, um, uh, our plan uh, very likely will include the creation of a significant conservation easement um, on the property, um, which would exist in perpetuity should this project um, come to fruition. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that, but I think in the event that this land would be decommissioned, I guess this would be a fairly large area that would then be left entirely open, and that's where I would have some concerns, but just in the, in the event, but I think yeah. that's a conditional thing. I mean, in, um, I, I, I'm a tree hugger. You know, I, I went into the solar business because I love the environment. Um, that being said, um, 195 trees I would never try to minimize, but in relation to 175 acre parcel of property, it's not like this is a forest right now. Um, so the, you know, although from an aesthetic perspective um, and from a, uh, you know, historic perspective, there are, you know, a lot of old trees on the property. Um, the, uh, the deployment of solar on, you know, approximately 20 acres of the 175 acres is not going to significantly alter the character um, of the property from a tree perspective. Um, we have no interest in removing any trees, for instance, on the south side of the Fort River we are not indiscriminately removing any trees. The only reason for tree removal in this project is to uh, clear the area of the potential arrays and to mitigate shade. Um, and that's it. So only the trees that absolutely have to be removed for those purposes will be removed. Christine? Just a couple other comments and positive. Um, without the manicuring so close to the stream or river, you decrease erosion into the, um, <clears throat> into the rivers. And I also want to say there'd be a lot of areas here that if that trees would be allowed to grow now. So over that 30 year period, I don't know if it will be 200, but it, the, a lot of trees will be growing in those areas, correct? Because, and they would just go up, you know, naturally. Yeah, so there will be a lot of natural vegetation that will crop up as a result of, you know, uh, this not being a golf course. Um, and um, I don't mean to let my kind of natural sarcasm shine a little bit, but if the town wanted to plant a forest on their side of the river, they could absolutely do that and plant 10,000 trees if they wanted to. I have a question which I'll pose first to staff and then perhaps the applicant about the decommissioning plan being that it's so far in the future that it would potentially come into play. How is it envisioned that that document would be incorporated into any decision that the ZBA um, might make, especially since it's kind of an, an affirmative promise being made to take an action at a certain point as opposed to a restriction placed on the property? The ZBA can include a condition that would require that um, when the project is decommissioned that they follow the decommissioning plan or else that they need to come back to the ZBA to um, propose a different type of plan and get that approved. Thank you. Would you like to include that as a recommendation? 
I would like to include that as a recommendation. And I was coming to a point where I think it would be worth summarizing the recommendations that we discussed so far to the ZBA, which included that they consider requiring a construction logistics plan. And if I understand correctly the recommendation regarding the trees, that the ZBA consider requiring that the decommissioning plan be modified to indicate that some or all of the trees being removed for the project would be replanted. David? I think that what was suggested by the applicant, that w I would encourage a recommendation being the creation of a conservation e easement for the town. That's not, I don't believe that's been included in the application. It is not currently. That's part of our uh, habitat management plan. Um, I don't know if technically the easement would be for the town. Do you know the answer to that? Um, you know, it, it, I don't know who the beneficiary of the easement would be, but yeah. I, can, I can get that for you. And then further, uh, there's been discussion, sorry, further there's been discussion about the, con the potential conveyancing of the balance of the property to the town. I'm not quite sure how that could be made a recommendation, but it seems to be at this point kind of a, a vagueish promise, but, but there's seem, but at least to my mind, there's a lot riding on what happens to the rest of the property. So, so I, would, I would characterize this as more uh, than a vague promise. Um, I will tell you that multiple meetings have taken place between the property owner and the town, and I would recommend that if you have questions about those meetings that you uh, speak to Dave Zymet. I believe that's the- Zomek, yes. Zomek. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and to David, your comment, um, ZBA would not be making a decision about whether to convey or to accept some of this land on behalf of the town. That's not within their purview. They'll be making a decision based on the same plans we're looking at right now. Chris? I, I was just, excuse me. I was just gonna say that as um, Doug has suggested, there is no agreement yet between the town and uh, the developer or the um, landowner. And there may be some um, money that changes hands as a result of a conveyance if it is to occur. So it's all very um, nebulous at this point and it's, there's nothing sure about it. So um, making a condition about that at this point probably isn't um, useful. Mm -hmm. So we've discussed a number of recommendations to make to the ZBA. Are there additions, additional questions or comments or comments from the applicant? Uh, if not, I'd entertain a motion to forward those recommendations to the ZBA. Second. Oh. We have to make one. Are you making it or me? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion? So, Sorry, who moved? I'm going to move Christine. to make a motion to close the public hearing. There's no public or, hearing. Oh, no public hearing, right, we've got it. So um, to approve the, oh, I should have thought, all right. So make a motion to uh, tell the CBA that we are uh, um, recommending approval of this project with the uh, additional comments and issues that have been added. Second. Moved and seconded, further discussion? All in favor? All opposed, all abstaining. So that passes 511. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much for Michael. having us. Uh, yeah, it was our, was the motion that we just passed to approve the proposal without any conditions? The motion was to recommend to the ZBA approval of the project with the conditions we discussed at tonight's meeting. I missed it. Sorry. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on now to the next item on our agenda. May I just say, um, we have a Maureen Pollock with us this evening. <laughs> Maureen Pollock is an associate planner, and she is following this project through the ZBA. So okay. she attended tonight to hear your comments. Thanks for joining us. All right, so moving now on to the next item on our agenda. This is item four, planning and zoning. The zoning subcommittee report. Uh, the zoning subcommittee met this evening with our new member, 
David has joined us. Thank you, David, for joining the ZSC. Uh, we work tonight uh, looking further at our priority list that we've been developing over the past several months, which we intend to pass on to the town council in some form. And so today we just revisited. We didn't really make any revisions, but members and staff are going to be working over the next few weeks to develop further clarifying language about the items on the priority list. Any public comments? Uh, there's no public left, so I'll take that <laughs> as a no. Is there any other business under planning and zoning? Seeing none, we'll move on to item five, old business. We've already covered item 5A, which related to North Pleasant Street and Halleck Street. Any old business topics not reasonably anticipated? Seeing none, new. Oh, I'm sorry. Item 5A under old business was the signing of the decision. So we will pass that around for signing. This is the site plan review decision. You've already signed the um, uh, special permit decision. Yeah. So that'll be passed around for signature. The new business item related to 236 North Pleasant Street is what we have already covered. And then moving on to item 6B, open meeting law, review and discussion of open meeting law requirements. We had received an email from staff about this. Is there further, Chris? Um, well, the town clerk wanted you to be aware of the requirements of the open meeting law and bring it to your attention at this time because we have a whole new group of people who are coming on board, namely the town council, and they are learning about all of these um, requirements and uh, regulations, and they wanted to make it clear to you what your um, interaction might be with them if they come to one of your meetings or if you go to one of their meetings and, and how you might interact. So we sent out the uh, email from the town clerk along with um, this document on the open meeting law and there was also a presentation that was given by um, KP Law uh, to the town council and some of us attended and it was very interesting and we, and we sent that to you as well. And then after that, Mr. Burt Whistle um, wrote to me and said that he would like an opportunity to ask some questions and have a discussion about the open meeting law. And so um, we put this on the agenda and so Mr. Burt Whistle might want to lead the discussion here. Yes, Michael. Uh, thank you uh, very much for including this. Uh, I, I had a, a whole series of questions on uh, the town clerk's uh, communication to us, uh, which were in my reading, either either contradictory or confusing, uh, or uh, that I didn't understand them because I don't, I'm not a lawyer. Um, and I want to try to make um, make my behavior on this body uh, both legal and appropriate. Um, and I guess the, f the, the first question um, has to do with the um, uh, town clerk's um, one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph on the, on the, on the second page, second side, um, where it says, individual members of public bodies may attend meetings of other public bodies, um, provided they communicate only by open participation and so on. And uh, does that, how does that apply to many of us who are representatives of this body to another body. It seems to me that if, as a member of the Design Review Board, for example, I express an opinion in that arena, uh, uh, well, as a member of the Planning Board, I shouldn't express an opinion in that arena. I, that, that I'm very confused about how that works and whether I have a right to vote in both of those bodies on the same question or exactly what my representation means. My understanding is that your representation means that you're a conduit of information from one group to another and that you are actually a member of the design review board so you have every right to participate in their discussions and express your opinions as you see fit in that arena and then to uh, bring that information back to the planning board. And then express my opinion in the planning board and vote opinion and vote in, the, in both bodies on the same issue. Chris? Yes, that's the case. Thank you. That makes me feel better. <laughs> now, um, 
uh, two paragraphs down, it says, if members of a public body attend a site visitor meeting of another body and they want to discuss matters raised, they should do so, they should request that a follow-up meeting of their own body be posted or an item be added to the future meeting agenda so the body can properly discuss the matter. Alternatively, a joint meeting of the two public bodies can be requested, could be requested. Um, now, again, uh, does this mean that uh, as a member of the planning board, I cannot speak as an individual at a ZBA hearing or at town council, or can I request a, a joint meeting of those bodies, or how does that apply? I, it's, it's very confusing. Chris. My understanding is that members of the board may speak as individuals in another arena, um, providing it's not something that the planning board is going to be taking up in the future. So if the ZBA is considering some project that the planning board won't ever uh, have on their agenda as a permitting item, then um, you all may go to another board meeting and say, although I'm a member of the planning board, I'm speaking as an individual at this time, and then give your opinion. I believe that would be the case if you went to the ZBA meeting about this Hickory Ridge project. If the planning board were also going to give a permit on this project, that wouldn't be appropriate. But since the planning board is only in an advisory role and has already given its advice, um, I believe that you would be uh, well within your rights to attend, say, a ZBA meeting about Hickory Ridge and say that you are an individual speaking as an individual and present your opinion. What if I were uh, in the minority on a planning board vote, as I often am, and uh, wish to speak in objection to a planning board's recommendation to another body? Would I then, be, would I be prohibited from speaking in that condition? I, I would suggest that you could, of course, speak as an individual. Well, I'm glad you would suggest that, but it certainly doesn't say that in this memo that we got. Chris? I think in that case, you wouldn't be speaking on behalf of the planning board. You would be saying to the Zoning Board of Appeals, I'm a member of the planning board, and I had this discussion with the planning board, and I chose to vote against the decision that they made. I believe you could do that. David? And I'm no expert, but it's my sense that your objection as a member of the planning board has already been noted and recorded as a member of the planning board. That's public record. When you're then speaking at another body, the ZBA in this case, in your individual capacity, that's, a, that's your individual voice. Your, your public vote has already been noted. Christine? So that doesn't quite answer my question. Does that mean I can or cannot speak in that context? Christine and then Michael. So I think like what Chris was saying in that case is, David was also saying like your role as a planning board member has already been noted and in those minutes. And then when you come to those meetings, if you say I am on the planning board, but I'm here to speak as an individual on this issue, then you've separated yourself from the planning board. And that's permitted. Yes, David. The metaphor that I often use is you're, you're acknowledging that you're wearing a different hat when speaking. So that when you're speaking on, as a member of the planning board, that's the hat you're wearing. When you're speaking in front of a different body, as an individual, you're wearing your hat, not the public, not your role as a public member, not a, as the public board's member. Chris and then Christine. So I would say that if, um, if your appearance before the ZBA were to occur before you uh, voted as a planning board member, then you would be um, not speaking appropriately before the ZBA. But since the planning board has already acted and has taken its um, vote, and this presumably will not be coming before the planning board again, then you may speak before the ZBA. It's, it's only when things are um, going to come before your own board and your own board is gonna be acting in some way you don't want to um, prejudge something and let uh, your fellow board members know how you feel before there's a discussion. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And the exception is when I'm a member of a voting member of both boards 
as in the ZBA, as, as in the plan, uh, Design Review Board and the Planning Board. Because the Design Review Board regularly makes recommendations to the Planning Board. Chris? So that's, that is perfectly fine and what you have been, the way you have been conducting yourself is perfectly fine. <laughs> Thank you. And the one more, one more, I'm sorry. Well, just to click, so the flip side of that, I'm thinking about like UTAC, right? I make it very clear that I am a liaison of the planning board when I'm there. So maybe it's, we all have to just kind of think of that when we're speaking sometimes different groups, what group we're representing. Pari? But I think Michael also has a voting capacity yeah. in his other entity. So he's allowed, but he's we allowed are. to express his opinion there as as an independent person and as a liaison because he's he he has a voting permission because he's also a member of the design board and that's how I was in there. Correct? That's correct and I don't want to further complicate your comment Christine but UTAC is a different type of entity it's not a, a public committee. No I'm just saying we should wherever we are we need to identify what we're speaking, so at the, um, at the design review board, if Michael wanted to speak on something not as a planning board rep, then he should say like, well, now I'm speaking as an individual and not a planning board person. But he has a voting right as a design review board member, so he can vote on things, and he doesn't have to clarify his planning board position. That's different from what you're saying. Chris? I agree with what Pari just said, that um, since Michael has a voting right on the DRB, that he can speak his mind at the DRB, and then he can bring that information to the planning board, but he has a, a right as a DRB member. He's not, a, he's not one of those liaisons that can't vote. He actually has a vote right. in the DRB, so he can express his personal opinion there, and he doesn't have to say, I'm not speaking. I mean, he's speaking as a DRB member. In that case, he's not speaking as a planning board member, he's speaking as a DRB member. So maybe that has to be cleared up. Sometimes we're just on a board and we can vote, and other times we're a liaison. And if you look at a lot of the wording on some of the boards and committees, the membership is written as a liaison, which in that case, to me, you are representing the group that you're coming from. And you still, of course, can always speak as yourself, but you have to identify that. So that would technically be registered in the minutes or whatever, or how people take your comment. Pari? Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, both the Design Review Board and the CPAC, you have voting member and you're part of that board member, in addition. Right. So it's a different thing. Right. At least for those two I know. Exactly. Right. I believe every town entity on this list of committee and liaison reports, the entity, the member from the planning board has voting rights. UTAC is a slight exception as I described and PVPC is not a town mm -hmm. entity. Chris? I'm not sure of this, but I think the Agricultural Commission may be an exception. I think that um, the planning board rep is a representative and not a voting member, but I can check that out. And currently, we do not have one of those. So. <laughs> Chris? Uh, Perry offered, volunteered to be a member of um, the AgCom, but she has not yet been appointed. Oh. So, and neither has Michael been appointed to CPAC yet. So those are things that need to be resolved. And the town council is getting its feet under itself and slowly getting to these resolutions. I feel like Mary <laughs> Are there other comments on this agenda item? Open meeting yeah. law? Michael? I'm sorry, I'm, I have two more. Um, um, <clears throat> the, um, the one, two, third paragraph of uh, the uh, uh, town clerk's memorandum seems to suggest that um, that Members of the planning that, that written communication is deliberation, and I want to make sure that, as I did once before, a, a letter that I prepared uh, for the planning board because I couldn't attend a meeting 
is permissible under the law. It seems to me that it may not be because it is a, it is a, it would seem to be a serial, what is a serial deliberation. I was going to comment that I don't consider it serial if you are just passing a message once and there's no response or, or forwarding or anything. And that's why we always indicate to handle those matters as such. Chris? The other thing was that that was clearly um, something that uh, was to be brought out in a public hearing. Mm -hmm. And we did provide copies to all the board members and we provided copies to the public. So that was a completely public document that expressed your opinion in that case. So I didn't see any problem with that. Good. Um, finally, um, I'm completely confused by the last paragraph. If attending a meeting of another public body, a conference or social event, a public body should avoid any appearance that the body is discussing municipal business. I have no idea what that could mean. Uh, I mean, isn't any public body discussing municipal business? I mean, isn't that what they're for? Chris? I think that statement might be a little too broad. I think what it's meant to say is that you shouldn't talk to other people that you see at that meeting about things that will come before your board. In other words, if you have a case that's coming before you about a new building that's going to be built downtown and um, you haven't held the public hearing yet, <laughs> and some member of another board comes up to you at, say, the Mass Municipal Association meeting and says, I want to tell you what my opinion of that new building is. You have to say to that person, don't tell me now. Please write to the board and come to our public hearing and make your opinion <coughs> known. But I can't talk to you about that case because it's going to be coming before the board in the future. So it doesn't mean that you can't talk about any municipal business at all. You could discuss what the town council is doing, or you could talk about the budget, or you could talk about the police coverage of your neighborhood or different things, but you can't discuss something that is going to be coming before the board, your board. So I cannot talk to a member of the town council about something that's going to come before the town council. Christine and then Chris. I just want to put in context that it's in a meeting of another body, a conference or a social event. I mean, if you contact one of the counselors, you can talk to them, or if you bump into one person on the street. But I think what they're saying is when you're in another meeting or a conference or a social event, and then there's that, you might want to touch also on that, there's two people talking, and then if there's three of us somewhere, even in a coffee shop, I think, isn't, you know, like talking, that could constitute a meeting, or is it three or four? Do you know what I'm saying, Chris? Chris. To be safe, you're really never supposed to talk outside of a public <coughs> meeting about anything that's going to be coming before the board, even if it's two of you or three of you. It's just getting into a gray area that you don't want to get into. So I would recommend against that. Really? So that as an individual... Well, that's the part I want I to am, clarify. I am somewhat disenfranchised. Uh, the whole point of this new town council system was that we had greater access to our re elected representatives. And if I cannot access my elected representative and explain to her what I think about an issue, I, I'm disenfranchised. Well, I think this particular sentence we're looking at is referring to a public body, which I think is meant a quorum of a public body. We've been speaking about it as if it's referring to restrictions on individuals. But that is not what the sentence is saying. It's talking about a quorum of a public body attending either a meeting of another body or a conference or a social event. So I think it's really reiterating that which we already knew about how a public body should conduct itself. Well, as long as, as, long as it doesn't refer to an individual. That's right. Um, That's I'm, I'm OK with that. But if it, defer, if it refers to us individually, uh, then I got a problem. Well, I've always been told that, you know, um, an example is if you go to the town landfill on a Saturday morning and someone approaches you and wants to talk about a project that's coming before your board the next Wednesday, you have to tell that person, I can't talk to you now. Come before the board, submit a letter, whatever. I can't talk to you now because it's coming before your board. So that's probably true of the town council as well, that you really shouldn't talk to them outside of a public meeting. 
unless, uh, yes, that's true. And um, you can submit a letter to them. You can come to their meeting and talk to them <coughs> then. But I don't think you're, um, you're supposed to talk to them outside of a public meeting. Jack? Uh, can you listen to them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that? He said, can Jack said, can you listen to them? You just listen to them. <laughs> no, you can't listen to them if they're talking to you about something that's going to be coming before your board. If they're going to tell you what they think about some site plan review application that's coming before your board, you, can, you have to tell them, please come to the meeting, uh, public hearing, and please submit something in writing. I can't talk to you about this now because it's coming before our board. So I think Chris is right and is erring on the side of caution here. And kind of the standard that I have thought of is that all the board members should be acting with the same information. And one way to get to that is to have anyone that we may be speaking to submit letters to the board. I would think that if a board member spoke to an individual prior to a meeting about a matter related, something that was coming before the board, if that board member shared all the details of the information that had been shared with them with the board, then I would think that would put the board on an equal footing and would not pose an issue. But then that, that level, think, you know, if your criteria is I need to share with the board every single thing, that I have a conversation with related to this project about, it's a very difficult standard to meet. And I think there's examples where some, that information could be shared with a board member that's pertinent to the project and is then later shared by that board member to the board. Um, but I think you know, Chris is right in the erring on the side of caution here. I wonder if there's any difference between an elected board and or an elected operation like the town council and an appointed board like ours. Uh, it seems to me that the premise of an elected board is that they are representative. And the premise of the planning board is that they're, they're not, we're not representative of anybody particularly. Um, we're theoretically representative of the whole town, but we're, it's not, this is not a representative body. Whereas the town council is, and if, 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 the idea of representative government is to hold, we have to be able to contact those people who represent us. Chris. So you may want to speak to the town manager about that issue. Um, he's sort of the gatekeeper for us as far as approaching town council members, and he may have some um, advice for you on whether you can talk individually to town council members. Christine. I would like to know about that. I've been on a lot of committees for a lot of years, and to me, this is called open meeting law, and it was mostly based about not having a meeting that is not, hasn't been announced, and there's an agenda, and there's minutes, and about people deliberating us amongst ourselves without being in a proper meeting. And I've never seen it slide so deep into one-on-ones talking to people my neighbors, whatever. I think that should be clarified because to me, open meeting is about the meetings and you don't want to be having a meeting without the proper transparency and um, agenda, etc. Chris. So in the past, we've held um, sessions with the town attorney where we talk about open meeting law, we talk about conflict of interest, we talk about holding meetings. Would you like me to um, schedule something? where you could ask your questions specifically of the town council, and it would probably be Lauren Goldberg who um, gave the presentation to the town council a couple of months ago. Christine? If others want that in a meeting, but I know that takes time and all that, but maybe the town needs to have one of those that you invite everybody who's on committees to go, and of course then it could be on the TV and people could watch it, that kind of thing. Even have some scenarios cooked up, you know, to help clarify people. Um, or even ask committees, maybe ask to write in questions, and it could be handled <coughs> that way, sort of as a group thing, because I think it's, the same thing's gonna be said over and over and over again. Okay. Jack? There's got to be a YouTube video on yeah. how to conduct yourself <laughs> just on don't, this topic. Yeah. Just don't comment on it when you share it with us. <laughs> Chris? I think that the presentation that Lauren Goldberg gave to the town council is on the town council website. So you could go there and, and see that video. And if I can find a link to it, I will send it to you. 
Christine? Just one last thing. So the one part that I cut and paste all the time out of this document is on minutes. About once a year, if I'm chair of a committee, I send it out to all the members because it's amazing how the minutes vary and, and how shocking some people are, what is, has to be included and what's optional and what doesn't have to be included. Um, so I've always, I've said this for years, maybe one class that has that part, but also like taking minutes. A lot of new people come on committees and stuff and there's never any training or, you know, you get this and you're supposed to read it, but the actual real life application of it, I just very often see something gets lost. Michael? I just wanted to add uh, in a kind of snarky moment that even the Attorney General says that these are her opinions and that the next Attorney General may have different opinions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on open meeting law? All right. We'll move on then to the next item, which is PVPC memorandum and request for comments. So I received this packet from PVPC, which included their 2019 calendar and major accomplishments and their top 10 resolves for 2019. Chris, was this emailed out to board members? Yes. The, uh, the letter and the top 10 resolves was emailed, uh, or people got in their mm -hmm. Um What they didn't get was that lovely calendar. We only got two copies of the office and then we were share the time date. So if anybody would like to see the calendar, who would like to see the calendar? <laughs> oh, nice calendar. I'm surprised they didn't lose the Okay, so they're requesting comments by February 18th, so if there are any comments from planning board members, they can forward those to staff or direct to PVPC. Chris, is there a preference? You could also read it carefully and then uh, talk about it at your next meeting if you want to. Sure, we can put this on the agenda for next okay, meeting. Put it on the Jack? Agenda. I have some very minor notes mm -hmm. uh, from the last meeting because it was, they discussed point by point, but. Nothing substantial. If we want to talk about it next meeting, that's fine. Happy to do so now, Jack, if you have comments on the document. First of all, they're not prioritized. Okay, number one <laughs> is the, the most important. Um, I just thought some uh, interesting notes that 75% uh, of the towns in the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission are rural, 75%. Um, and then going down to number 10, which regards uh, where the taxes go, uh, Tim Brennan mentioned that uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission isn't um, it's not uh, treated equitably necessarily because there are uh, a share that goes to you know, regional um, uh, entities such as the MBTA, which Pioneer Valley uh, doesn't really have something of that uh, you know, stature. And so we're, we're, we're kind of hemorrhaging a little bit with regard to our fair share. There, there's that argument that could be made. I think that's about it, though. Okay. So we will place that again on our agenda for our next meeting. Are there any new business topics not reasonably anticipated? Any ANR subdivision applications? No form A's? Upcoming ZBA applications? <laughs> Any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? All right, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports, PVPC, we just spoke about. Anything further on that? Uh, I, I had mentioned uh, to Chris the presentation uh, of the last meeting. Uh, the speaker was from the Massachusetts uh, uh, Aging, uh, Healthy Aging Collaborative, which I wasn't familiar with, but it, it, I, I thought it was very interesting. and. Uh, there are a number of towns and counties that have, uh, I'm not sure certification is the right word, but uh, Berkshire County 
is, is deemed an age-friendly area. Uh, I think Northampton just got it. A few other towns uh, have it, but Amherst doesn't, and I thought it would be a worthy um, uh, initiative for the town to take on that they get that, and, and then it's extended by AARP, and when it comes down to it, it, it really deals, it's not with ADA type matters, but it's, it's more related to other things. Uh, and there is even a, a component uh, of uh, facilitating uh, folks with uh, dementia and you know, other aging issues. So it's not all about accessibility. Um, you know, see my, so you know, a lot of it is inclusion and equity and things like that. I know that the town has an aging council, you know, so maybe they take it up, uh, pursue it, but uh, a lot of it comes down to just uh, improving signage, uh, having facilities that you would think, you know, having a restroom, you would, you know, someone downtown wondering around would know where to go and, and uh, we get lost and that sort of thing. It's just, it's just an interesting uh, thing that I think Amherst, uh, because although we have all the, the you know, college students and that, having uh, to accommodate our senior citizens is pretty important. And it's a small thing, but it's something I think would be in the best interest of the town to, uh, to acquire. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, so Jack, I noticed on number eight of that 10 list, yes. it said begin a pilot project with communities of Tikopee, Holyoke, and South Hadley. Did they talk about that? Is that something that if it goes well, then they would look for other towns to do the same thing? And could Amherst stay on top of that? Yeah, so that, that was a, um, I'm looking at my notes, I'm a little confused here. <laughs> Uh, but, but so uh, Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission took three towns and Well, th so there's three towns, and it's, it's a pilot program in terms of uh, they got funding, uh, and, they're, and they're going through this process and the, with the assistance of Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So they're not on their own. It's, it's a Pioneer Valley Planning Commission where they're helping, whereas I imagine if Amherst would do it, it would, we would be on our own to, to implement the age-friendly measures. Chris. Every year, um, PVPC puts out a, what, a circular that um, re requests or invites us to apply for funding for projects. And um, so it could be that um, next year we might apply for funding for um, a project to help us become an age-friendly community. So I should tell you that this year we've applied for um, funding for technical assistance to look at our streetscapes. And I talked a little bit about this with the zoning subcommittee tonight. Um, the idea is that we have a streetscape design guideline that is um, fairly old. It was developed in the early 2000s. And um, a lot of it doesn't make sense anymore, um, particularly with regard to the way the sidewalks are designed and um, possibly our benches and our lighting certainly isn't um, you know, dark sky compliant. So looking at all of those things, um, we may want to come up with a new set of streetscape standards and Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, if we get this grant, uh, would help us to get started on that. Jack. <laughs> I found my notes, it's just like on the front page, that's all, but uh, uh, so it's Chicopee, Holyoke, and South Hadley, and it's a collaborative effort, and they got a grant from uh, Tufts uh, Health Plan Foundation and the, the, the four tenants uh, are getting, developing an action plan, and then there's an aging livability score that the Mass uh, Healthy Aging Collaborative uh, maintains, and Amherst is on there. Um, 
and the third is uh, just community engagement methods, and then coming up, the fourth would be regional age-friendly initiatives. Great, anything else from PVPC? That's it. Okay, uh, CPAC, we just heard is vacant, but Michael's being appointed, waiting on action from town council. Is that correct, Chris? So people who have been nominated can feel free to attend meetings. You just won't be able to vote until you're actually appointed. And I'm working on that. I'm nudging the town manager and others to <laughs> bring this to the town council. Pari? Can you just then share some information with us about their meetings? Or how do we find out? Um, are you asking about town council meetings? No, no, I'm asking about, let's oh, say. Oh. I see. When does the AGCOM meet? When does CPAC meet? Yes, I can share that with you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Design Review Board. Uh, we have met uh, fairly recently, uh, last week, I think, um, and reviewed and approved three new uh, sign requests for the uh, downtown area. Great, thank you. The Affordable Housing Trust met last week, spent most of our time discussing an RFP that's going to be put out related to the East Street School project, um, seeking submissions for developers of mostly affordable housing on that site. Uh, so looking to get that put out in the next, in the coming months. Zoning subcommittee, we already discussed. UTAC housing has not met in, I think, over a year. Uh, economic development, same. Downtown parking working group. Um, uh, just that the town should be making a public announcement within the next week about how a consultant has been brought on to start working on parking. Great, thank you. Uh, report of the chair, happy to be starting off another year with the planning board, enjoying our new facilities here. This is quite the upgrade. So thanks to the town for all their hard work on that. Report of staff. I have no further report. Thank you. All right, then we're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.